50 million years ago, anglerfish walked the seafloor. Today, the deeper they descend, the more grotesque and horrifying they become. Their jaws expand, their lures grow, and in the pitch-black abyss, evolution pushes them toward the extreme. Glowing bait, monstrous forms, and a reproduction strategy so parasitic, it rewrites biology itself. Why do these changes escalate with depth? The truth behind why anglerfish get more horrifying the deeper you go begins at the edge of their ancient migration. 50 million years ago, anglerfish belonged to a world far different from the one they haunt today. Their ancestors crept along the ocean floor on stubby, limb-like fins, hugging the benthic landscape in search of food. These early forms were squat, armoured, and adapted for a life of ambush among rocks and sediment. But as the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum swept across the planet, ocean temperatures surged and currents shifted. The seafloor became a less stable home, and entire lineages faced a stark choice – adapt or vanish. Some anglerfish began to leave the bottom behind. They drifted upward, following the slow rain of organic matter into the open water, a move that would change the course of their evolution. In this new mid-water world, the rules were different. There was no shelter, only endless darkness and the constant threat of starvation. The anglerfish that survived were those that could improvise, transforming their bodies and behaviours to suit the demands of the deep. This journey from the benthos to the abyss did not go unnoticed. In 1976, aboard the research vessel Albatross IV, Dr. Theodore W. Peach encountered a living bathypelagic anglerfish for the first time. The specimen, hauled from the blackness, seemed almost impossible, a creature shaped by pressures and privations few could imagine. Peach later wrote, that it was by pure coincidence, a stroke of luck, that he found himself looking into another human frontier, the abyss, through a unique looking glass called ceratioid anglerfishes. He said he considered himself a very lucky individual to be blessed with such an opportunity, and that is a gross understatement. This moment sparked a lifetime of discovery. Peach's work traced the lineage of anglerfish from their bottom-dwelling origins to their radical reinvention as pelagic drifters. The migration into deeper and deeper water set the stage for the extraordinary adaptations that would follow. Traits that push the boundaries of what life can become when forced to survive in the planet's harshest environment. In the bathypelagic world, Every contour of the anglerfish's body is a record of scarcity and darkness. Dr. Daniel Jones of the University of Southampton describes these fish as living blueprints of evolutionary pressure. Food is so rare at these depths that missing a single meal could mean death. Over generations, this relentless hunger has sculpted the anglerfish into a creature of extremes. The jaws are the most dramatic evidence. In some species, the gape can stretch to nearly the length of the entire body, up to 80 or even 100%. This means an anglerfish can swallow prey almost as large as itself in a single desperate bite. Dr. Jones points to recent three-dimensional scans and deep sea footage, showing jaws that unhinge with a snap revealing rows of backward curved teeth. These are not just for catching prey, but for making sure nothing escapes once caught. The lure, or elysium, tells another part of the story. In shallow water relatives, it is a stubby appendage, sometimes no longer than a fin ray. But in the deepest species, the elysium can reach up to twice the length of the anglerfish's body. In Gigantactus van Hoefeni, the glowing filament trails behind like a living fishing line, sometimes longer than the fish itself. This adaptation is not about elegance, it is about reach. 
in water where food may drift by only once in a lifetime, a longer lure means a wider hunting range and a better chance at survival. A 2024 study using museum specimens and genetic analysis found that the disparity in anglerfish body shapes actually increases with depth. Some become bloated and globular, others thin and almost thread-like. The deeper the habitat, the more exaggerated the features. Dr. Jones explains that these extremes are not random. They are the result of relentless selection for any trait that improves the odds of finding, catching and swallowing whatever the abyss provides. In the deep, every grotesque form is a solution to a problem most animals will never face. In the darkness below a thousand meters, the anglerfish's lure becomes a living lantern, powered by an alliance as strange as any in nature. At the tip of the elongated dorsal spine sits the esker, a fleshy bulb packed with millions of symbiotic bacteria, mostly from the genus Photobacterium. These bacteria are not passengers. They are the source of the anglerfish's light, producing a steady blue glow that falls between 470 and 490 nanometers. This wavelength travels farther through seawater than any other color, making it the perfect beacon in the abyss. The esker is more than a simple bulb. Its tissues are laced with blood vessels delivering oxygen and nutrients both to the fish and its bacterial tenants. Micro CT scans reveal a dense internal structure, lenses that focus the light, filters that shape its intensity, and tiny pores that may help the anglerfish expel old bacteria or modulate the glow. The lure can be waved, twitched, or even dimmed suggesting a level of control that goes beyond simple reflex. Some researchers believe the anglerfish adjusts the chemistry inside the esker, altering oxygen or acidity levels to turn the light up or down as needed, though the exact mechanisms remain unresolved. The bacteria themselves have undergone a dramatic transformation. Genomic studies show that anglerfish symbionts have shed much of their DNA, keeping only the genes needed for light production, nutrient uptake, and survival within the host. Yet unlike many symbionts, these photobacterium strains retain genes for flagella and chemotaxis, tools for swimming and sensing their environment. This means that anglerfish do not inherit their glowing partners directly. Instead, larvae and juveniles are born without light. Only later do they acquire bacteria from the surrounding seawater, a process confirmed by surveys of young anglerfish and environmental sampling. These symbionts are acquired, not passed down. The lure's blue glow is not just a trick of chemistry, it is a solution to the central problem of life in the deep, how to draw prey close enough to catch. In the gloom, the faintest shimmer can mean the difference between starvation and survival. By borrowing the light of bacteria and evolving a specialized organ to wield it, anglerfish have solved the riddle of hunting in darkness. The living lantern does not just illuminate the abyss, it feeds it. At a depth of 1,300 meters, the Schmidt Ocean Institute submersible captured an encounter that left the crew speechless. A female anglerfish, barely the size of a grapefruit, drifted through the blackness with a tiny male fused to her belly. The male, no larger than a thumb, had bitten into her flank and become a permanent fixture, a living appendage sustained entirely by her blood. Over time, his jaws, eyes, and even much of his brain atrophied. What remained was a sack of sperm, veins, and arteries 
woven directly into her circulatory system. This is not a rare accident, but the rule for deep sea ceratioid anglerfish. In a world where potential mates may pass within reach only once in a lifetime, reproduction demands a solution as radical as the abyss itself. The biology of this union is almost impossible to believe. The female's immune system should recognize the male as a foreign intruder and attack, yet somehow it does not. Rival labs have spent years locked in debate. Researchers at the Max Planck Institute argue that female anglerfish suppress key immune genes, sacrificing normal defenses to accept the male. Woods Hole scientists counter that bacteria living on the fish's skin may act as peacekeepers, modulating immune signals and allowing fusion. The evidence is mounting on both sides, but no consensus has been reached. Gene sequencing from fused pairs shows unusual patterns of immune suppression, while microbial surveys reveal a dense, shifting community at the fusion site. Footage from 2022 brought new urgency to these questions. The male's body, once independent, had become a mere extension of the female, a conduit for sperm, nothing more. This is the ultimate bond, forged by scarcity and isolation. It is also an evolutionary gamble. If a female accepts the wrong male, or if her defenses fail at the moment of fusion, she risks infection or death. Yet for the anglerfish, there is no alternative. In the deep, where chance meetings are measured in years, only the most extreme strategy can keep the lineage alive. At depths below 1,300 meters, anglerfish display jaws that can reach up to 100% of their body length and lures two times as long. Decades of research, including Dr. Theodore W. Peach's 1976 field notes and the Schmidt Ocean Institute's 2022 in situ footage have mapped how these adaptations arose through relentless evolutionary pressure. We now know that their bioluminescent lures depend on photobacterium symbionts, while the permanent fusion of male and female anglerfish remains one of the most extreme reproductive strategies ever recorded. Yet scientists still debate the precise genetic and immune mechanisms that make this fusion possible. Most evidence points to gene suppression or microbial mediation, but key details remain unresolved. The story of the anglerfish is a reminder. The deeper life goes, the more radical its solutions become. Every new discovery reveals not only how little light reaches the abyss, but how much remains hidden. <laughs>